there's something over and above uh, the chemicals and the genes involved in inheritance. I think that the morphic fields that shape the leaves, the flowers, the organs of animal bodies like kidneys and livers, the overall form of an animal, I think these are organized in nested hierarchies. So there's a field for the whole animal, a field for the different organs, fields for the tissues within those, fields for the cells within those, fields for the organelles within those, and then for the molecules and the atoms. All of these structuring fields, they're maintained by morphic resonance. It's through fields and archetypal patterns and forms that morphic resonance is expressed. On behalf of IPSA, the Institute for Psychosystems Analysis, it is my absolute pleasure, privilege, and indeed honor to welcome Dr. Rupert Sheldrake to speak with us today. Dr. Sheldrake is a biologist and author of more than 90 scientific papers, in addition to either writing or co-writing a total of 15 books, which have been published into 28 languages. He published his first book, The Landmark, A New Science of Life, in 1981 and has had a long and illustrious career across many sub-disciplines of biology, studying under natural conditions in the true spirit of science, unexplained aspects of animal and human behavior, including the telepathic abilities of dogs, cats, and other animals, and in humans, the sense of being stared at, telepathy between mothers and babies, telepathy in connection with telephone calls and premonitions. Dr. Sheldrake's research is often cited as part of the professional training curriculum here at IPSA, as among many other things, his theory of morphic resonance has strong explanatory power for many of the clinically derived observations taught by Steve and Pauline Richards, the founders of IPSA, such as the nature of instinct, affect, and indeed the biopsychosocial dynamics of working with the psyche in depth. So I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I say, welcome to IPSA, Dr. Sheldrake. Today's seminar will begin with 40 minutes from Dr. Sheldrake on morphic resonance, individual and collective memory, and the extended mind. Following this, both Dr. Sheldrake and Steve Richards will have a dialectic together around what was discussed. Then for the final half hour or so, Dr. Sheldrake has kindly offered to take Q&A which many of you guys present today have submitted to me in advance, as well as taking questions on the fly as well. So I'd like to pass it over to yourself, Dr. Sheldrake. Thank you so much for being with us here this evening. Well, thank you, James, and thank you, Steve, for arranging this. And I already know from um, my exchanges with Steve that you have a very wide range of interests that go way beyond uh, the narrow focus of many psychologists and psychotherapists. So it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm going to talk about um, four different aspects of the mind and, and um, 40 minutes isn't very long to do it. So I may move fairly fast through these. First, I'm going to say something about morphic resonance. Secondly, I'm going to talk about morphic fields and archetypes. Um, Third, about the extended mind in normal everyday life, um, how the mind is much more extensive than the brain spatially. And finally, about dimensions of consciousness with which our extended minds connect, uh, where they may connect with the more than human level of consciousness. But starting uh, first with morphic resonance. Um, morphic resonance in its most general form is the idea there's a kind of memory in nature and that the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. Each species has a collective memory. Each individual draws on the collective memory and in turn contributes to it. In this sense, the idea is rather similar to Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. But whereas he was thinking about human psychology, morphic resonance uh, suggests this is part of every species, indeed every kind of thing, including crystals and molecules. They too have collective memories. So it's not a special feature of humans, it's part of the way nature works. One reason I think we need to consider morphic resonance is that 
in a radically evolutionary universe, which we now have, according to modern physics, uh, starting with the Big Bang about 14 billion years ago, um, everything in nature has evolved. Yet contemporary science is still based on the old assumption that it's all governed by timeless eternal laws, which were all fixed at the moment of the Big Bang. Now, there's no evidence for that. Um, it's simply an, a carryover from an older platonic cosmology that influenced the founders of modern science. Um, and I think in a radically evolutionary universe, it makes more sense to think of the laws of nature as evolving, or indeed being more like habits um, than uh, fixed laws like, that were like a kind of cosmic Napoleonic code at the very beginning of the universe. Morphic resonance depends on similarity, and it depends on a resonance between similar self-organizing patterns across space and time from the past to the present. The key is similarity here. And the reason rats tune into a rat morphic field is because they're similar to other rats. And if they're confronted with a particular puzzle, which rats in the past have solved before, they're more likely to solve it more easily because it's the same, they're the same species and on the same breed, and it's the same puzzle. Similarity tunes them in and they resonate. And so if lots of rats learn a new trick, it gets easier for other rats to learn the same thing. And there's actually evidence that this happens from laboratory experiments. The same is true of crystals. If a new compound is crystallized repeatedly, it should get easier to crystallize all over the world. And indeed, that's what seems to happen. So this, I can't go into all the evidence for it now, which is summarized in my book, uh, The Presence of the Past. But for those who are not familiar with the idea, that's the general basis. Now, when we come to humans, um, probably the most radical aspect of this hypothesis is that memories are not stored in brains. The conventional materialist assumptions of science um, mean that practically all neuroscientists assume that memories must be stored inside the brain, because where else could they be? If memories exist, they must be material, according to materialism. That means they're in physical traces in the brain, modified synapses, phosphorylated proteins, possibly even changes in DNA or RNA. At any rate, they've got to be physical, they've got to be material inside the brain. And for a hundred years, scientists have tried to find these me postulated memory traces inside brains, and they've failed over and over again. Um, Carl Lashley in the 1950s uh, did experiments on rats and monkeys. He trained them to learn new tricks, then cut out large chunks of their brains and found that when they recovered from the operation, they could remember what they'd learned. And it didn't matter which bit of the brain he cut out. That's why his student, Carl Pribram, came up with the idea that memory must be stored holographically all over large regions of the brain to account for the fact it survived such extensive damage. Of course, damage to the brain can affect memory. Um, the, the strokes, uh, brain injuries, concussion uh, can lead to amnesia. Uh, but this doesn't prove the memories are in the brain. It could just be that these injuries affect the ability to retrieve or process the memories. Just as if I damaged your TV set and made it aphasic so you couldn't get any sounds out of it, it wouldn't prove all the sounds originated inside the TV set. It would merely prove the sound circuit was important for processing these signals with which the set was resonating. So what I'm suggesting is that um, memories are not stored in the brain. Um, even degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, uh, which lead to loss of memory, don't necessarily mean that the people have lost their, the ability to recover memories in principle. Simply in practice, the brain is no longer in a fit state to recover them. However, as some of you may know, there's a fascinating phenomenon called terminal lucidity, whereby some people who've had dementia for years um, uh, become lucid in a day or two before they die, shortly before they die. Um, they remember who people are, they remember things they everyone's assumed they've forgotten. Uh, they become very clear. I know this is true because I had this experience with my own brother who had dementia. 
and uh, but just shortly before he died earlier this year. So um, I think that the uh, idea that memories are stored in the brain uh, is something we can move on uh, from. Um, and what it means is that the retrieval of individual memories and the retrieval of collective memories um, are different in degree, not in kind. Um, the, we retrieve our own memories because we're more similar to ourselves in the past than we are to anyone else. But we're similar to other people as well, and especially members of our families and same social group and people who are similar to us in the past. And um, those are the collective memories we're most influenced by, but we're similar to all other humans to some degree. And so I think we're subject to a collective memory from all humanity and possibly from previous primate species as well. And no doubt from pre-primate mammals too, a darker, deeper and, and longer uh, memories, which I think underlie our most fundamental instincts, uh, which are like habits of the species and in fact many instincts we share with other animals um, so they're like collective habit habits of mammals well um so collective memory and morphic resonance um uh, and memories not being in the brain that's one theme which i'm sure relates to some of your practice uh in psychology but i now want to talk about how these memories are expressed. Memories are expressed through what I call morphic fields. Um, the word morphe means form or shape, and they're structuring fields that underlie the patterns of things. Now, um, archetypes um, in, uh, are not just to do with psychological archetypes. Um, they're also to do with form. When Plato used this term, he was referring to forms in general, including the archetypes of plants. In modern bi developmental biology, these are called morphogenetic fields, form-shaping fields. And the concept of morphogenetic fields was put forward in the 1920s. And, and um, I didn't invent it myself. I, I inherited it, as it were, uh, when I was working at Cambridge on the development of plants. And it became clear to me that if we're going to understand why plant species are different from each other and why a leaf is different from a flower petal and that's different from a sepal, uh, it's not enough just to say it's the genes because they've all got the same genes, the same DNA. Um, and it's not enough to say it's just a matter of switching on and off proteins uh, because proteins alone can't explain the shape or form of an organ. Your arm and the leg, your legs have the same proteins, the same genes, the same chemicals. They're chemically identical, uh, the same bones and so is bone substance. Uh, and yet they have different shapes and your right hand and your left hand uh, have different shapes or at least they're mirror images of each other even though they're chemically identical. So there's something over and above uh, the chemicals and the genes involved in inheritance. And uh, I think that the morphic fields that shape the leaves, the flowers, the organs of animal bodies like kidneys and livers, the overall form of an animal, I think these are organized in nested hierarchies. So there's a field for the whole animal, a field for the different organs, fields for the tissues within those, fields for the cells within those, fields for the organelles within those, and then for the molecules and the atoms. Um, uh, all of these structuring fields are to do with, um, they're, they're maintained by morphic resonance. It's through fields and archetypal patterns and forms that morphic resonance is expressed. Um, and the more often these patterns are repeated, the more habitual they become and the more likely they are to happen again. This also applies to social fields, the way in which social groups are organized, because there's a morphic field not only for the individual person or animal, but also for the social group of which they're part. And this is most immediately obvious when you watch flocks of starlings or murmurations flying together. The whole flock behaves like a single organism and it can change direction and 
wheel and turn. Um, and the individual birds within the flock not only know where their neighbors are, but they know where they're going to go. Otherwise they'd bump into each other when the flock changes direction, and yet they don't. The best computer models of these murmurations treats the individual birds uh, rather like iron filings within a magnetic field. There's a, a top-down organizing principle of the field of the whole social group. In termites, the field of the whole group helps to coordinate the behavior of the individual insects, which are blind, um, so that they can move little balls of mud and build those prodigious termite structures with complex architecture. Um, the individual termites can't see what other ones have done. Um, they don't have a concept of the overall plan, uh, but they just know their place within that field and put the mud particle where the next one's meant to go. They're responding to something larger than themselves, an organizing field. Um, and the same is true of other social insects. Now, I think that human families have fields as well. They're social groups. Um, and members of the group have their place in relation to other members of the family. And these fields also have a kind of memory. Um, this, I think, plays an important part in, in systemic family constellation work. My wife, Jill Purse, is a very skilled practitioner of systemic family constellations. And through her and through Bert Henninger, who I um, used to know quite well, um, and through other practitioners of that kind of therapy, I've seen plenty of examples that convince me that there are fields which connect together the members of the family group, and also that they have a memory um, from previous generations. It's a remarkable thing in these therapeutic settings where um, people who represent members of the family pick up feelings or emotions or know things about the family field which they couldn't normally know through normal means. They're not just acting. I'm sure many of you have seen this kind of thing in action. Um, so I think that there, there's, there's then this dimension of uh, the structure of, of the fields. Now in the human mind, I think this, these morphic fields correspond quite closely to what Jung called archetypes, which are patterns or structures that organize the the psyche the way in which psychic contents are organized and related to each other uh, which are reflected in myths and in symbols uh, and uh, appear in various different cultures appear in dreams uh, in various forms um, and i think that in the context of morphic resonance and morphic fields the jungian archetypes make tremendously good sense. In fact, if they didn't already exist, they'd have to be invented as a concept. Um, they don't make much sense in the light of conventional mechanistic biology, which is all about genes and proteins and molecules. Um, and that's one reason why Jung's not taken very seriously within mainstream materialist science. But in this more expanded scientific vision, um, this, this makes a, a lot of sense. Now, coming on to the extended mind, I've been talking up till now about memory processes and the patterning, the influence of the past. Um, when we come to the extended mind, um, I think our minds are not confined to the insides of our heads as the conventional uh, materialist view supposes. I mean, it's not as if materialists have proved that the mind is nothing but the activity of the brain. That's the assumption from which they start. Um, and uh, however badly the evidence fits, it doesn't matter much because they cling to this belief, which is accepted on blind faith by most materialists. Um, and so they think the mind, the mind is nothing but the activity of the brain and therefore it's all inside the head. This has many implications for interpreting our very ordinary experience. Um, the nature of vision, according to the conventional view, is that light comes reflected off an object or is emitted by an object, goes through the electromagnetic field, enters the eyes, inverted images form on the retinas, 
impulses go up the optic nerves, and then various patterns of activity occur in various parts of the brain. That's what science shows in great detail, and brain scans have revealed more detail than ever before about which parts of the brain are involved. But you see, there are two problems here. It doesn't really explain vision because, um, first of all, it doesn't explain why we're conscious of what we see. This is the so-called hard problem of consciousness, which materialists find impossible to solve. Um, they assume that the world is made up of unconscious matter. Brains are made of unconscious matter. Uh, so therefore, how come we're conscious? Um, well, they can't really explain that. Um, and that's why it's called the hard problem. One of the most favorite explanations is that consciousness is a kind of illusion produced by the activity of the brain. But of course, that doesn't explain it because illusion is itself a mode of consciousness. Um, that's why it's called the hard problem. I'm not talking about that now, but, but I'll just pass over the hard problem and come to the second problem with the conventional theory of vision, which is that it says, all the images that you're seeing now, or when you, whenever you look around you, you, all those images are inside your brain. The activity of the brain produces three-dimensional colored images inside your head, a kind of virtual reality display. That's what you experience. But nobody's ever seen a virtual reality display inside the head. Um, these images are, are simply a postulate, an assumption of the materialist theory of vision. Um, and I don't think there's a shred of evidence that they actually exist inside the brain. Instead, I suggest that the images of what we see are actually where they seem to be. Like you're seeing me now on a screen um, and your image of me on the screen, I think is where it seems to be out there, not inside your brain, actually on the screen. Um, in other words, I'm suggesting that we project out our images uh, to where they seem to be. If I look at a tree out of the window, then my image of the tree is where the tree is. It's projected out to there. If I look at a, a star up in the sky, my mind projects this image literally over astronomical distances to where the star is. And of course, it would also have to project it backwards in time. Uh, because the, the light has taken a few minutes or years to reach uh, 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 us here on Earth. So um, I think that uh, the images, when we look at things, are projected out to where they seem to be. This is not a new theory of vision, of course, it's what Plato thought, it's what Euclid thought, and it's why Euclid was able to explain mirror images in the 5th century BC. In the mirror, what he said is uh, your projection just goes straight through the mirror and the projection is behind the mirror. Uh, it's a virtual image according to modern science, i.e. something produced by the mind. Um, and every time you look in a mirror, you're seeing these outward projections. I mean, it's hard to realize how immediate, how provocatively contrarian our own immediate experience of seeing objects out there and seeing images in mirrors is compared with the official materialist theory. Every time you look in a mirror, every time you look at something, in a way your most immediate experience is refuting uh, the materialist theory that it's all inside your head. Because I'm a scientist and not a philosopher, um, when I thought about this way of interpreting vision, um, I realized that this is something that, uh, first of all, is common to people all over the world. If you ask traditional people everywhere in the world how they see vision, almost all of them think that images are projected out. And so do children until they're about nine or 10 years old. Jean Piaget, in his book, The Child's Conception of the World, shows that until the age of about 10, the average European child um, believes that images are projected out to where they seem to be, which is why Superman comics show eye beams going out of his eyes and why Roald Dahl's story Miranda is, 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 is very popular at the, um, with, with children because the idea that uh, she could have eye beams that move things appeals to children, that's how they think. 
that by the age of 10 or 11, Piaget said, the average child learns what he called the correct view, which is that thoughts and images are invisible things located inside the head. So I'm suggesting they're not. I'm suggesting that they're extended out uh, into the world around us. Um, our minds extend out in every act of vision or perception. And I'm not saying this is something special for humans. I think this is happening with all animals with image forming eyes. Um, so I think they're all extend. The world is full of these visual projections, just as it's full of radio waves and mobile telephone transmissions. We don't see them, uh, but they're there. And um, these visual projections, I think, are um, the way vision works in all animals with image forming eyes. Now, this is testable. And the tests I've done, as you know, are, are based on the sense of being stared at. Can people tell uh, when they're being looked at from behind, even if they don't know somebody's there? And even if the person is looking at them through a window, for example, through a car window, um, um, it's they can't see them, hear them, smell them. Can they detect the gaze, the power of the looks? And as soon as you ask that, you realize that this is a very well-known phenomenon. It's known all over the world, in all cultures. It's known to children in our own society. Surveys show that 95% of the population have experienced this. And most people have also experienced the, the other way around, looking at people and finding they turn around. Now, for most people, this is clear proof that the mind can affect things at a distance. And in many cultures like India, the Arab world, and parts of Africa, uh, they believe that you can actually affect things by the way you look at them. If you look at them with envy or anger, you can actually harm things. And that's the basis of the very widespread belief in the evil eye. Um, there's a word for it in all European languages, Berze Blick in German, Malocchio in Italian. Um, it's a very, very uh, widespread belief. But within the world of science, it's instantly condemned as total superstition. The sense of being stared at um, comes under the same taboo as the evil eye uh, and is utterly dismissed, even though practically everyone's experienced it. Uh, So-called skeptics like to say extraordinary claims demand extraordinary proof. But when it comes to the sense of being stared at, this is not an extraordinary claim. It's a totally ordinary claim since the vast majority of people make it. Um, the extraordinary claim is that this is all nonsense and doesn't exist, uh, which is made by the so-called skeptics. Uh, and they have no evidence at all to support that belief. It's just pure prejudice. Well, one can do experiments on the sense of being stared at, and as you probably know, I've done many of them, and so have other people. And in simple tests based on statistical uh, tests where you look or don't look in a random sequence, um, the results show that people really can tell when they're being looked at. And surprisingly, it even works through closed circuit television. Um, if you measure skin resistance, which measures emotional arousal as in a lie detector, um, and you have people looked at or not looked at through a closed circuit television camera, um, the skin resistance changes when they're being looked at compared with when they're not being looked at in a statistically significant way. So I think the evidence is overwhelming. This is real. Um, ordinary people are aware of it. People who look at others for a living, like private detectives, store detectives at Harrods, uh, um, uh, surveillance personnel, are very aware of it. In the martial arts, oriental martial arts, people train their sensitivity because it's useful. Um, animals seem to be sensitive to being looked at. Wildlife photographers and hunters have a great deal of experience of this and are pretty convinced that animals can tell when they're being looked at um, by a hidden potential predator. And I think, in fact, this has evolved in the context of predator-prey relationships. Um, a hidden predator um, would be more likely to catch its prey if the prey couldn't detect when it was being looked at than if it could. So it would be a very useful sensitivity to develop and to evolve. I think that that helps us realize that our minds reach out from our brains through 
attention. And the very word attention implies this. It comes from the Latin root ad tendere, to stretch towards. And um, I think through attention, our minds stretch out towards what we're looking at. Through intention, they stretch into uh, what we're uh, intending. And I think that this is the basis of telepathy. Members of social groups like wolf packs, um, flocks of birds, um, social insect colonies are linked together through morphic fields, which I've already mentioned. If members of the group go away, um, as adult wolves do to go hunting, leaving the cubs in the den with a babysitter, um, the bonds between them are not broken, they're, they're stretched. They remain connected through the morphic field um, uh, even at great distances. And a change in one, I think, can affect the other and through the morphic field of the group. And that, I think, is the basis of telepathy. Um, I think it's a perfectly normal, natural um, way of communication. It's, not, it's normal, not paranormal, natural, not supernatural, and is better developed in most animals than it is in people. People have it not because they're special, but because they're animals. And typically it happens with, between members of social groups, among animals that are bonded to each other and among people that are bonded to each other or among people and animals that are bonded like dogs and their owners. When I first got interested in telepathy because I saw it as an aspect of the morphic fields of social groups, um, I worked with animals because they're more sensitive than people and some of you will have seen my book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, where I studied the well-known phenomenon where many dogs and cats anticipate the arrival of a member of the family by waiting at a door or window. Um, they seem to know when the person's coming home. They pick up their intention to come home. And telepathy is mainly about picking up intentions or needs. It's not about thought transference, um, downloading huge amounts of information like sort of 20 digit numbers and that sort of thing. It's about much more simple uh, biological things. Um, it matters to a dog when its owner is coming home. It matters to a dog when its owner is going to take it for a walk and often they pick up owner's intentions before they've even moved from their seat, even if they're in a different room. Um, and it matters to dogs and cats and other animals when they're going to be fed. And they often anticipate when their owner intends to give them a treat and, and get very excited. Um, so the telepathy is about these kinds of things. It happens also between mothers and babies. Um, uh, many nursing mothers pick up the needs of their babies. And I've done studies with nursing mothers and babies when they're miles apart, uh, showing that the um, mothers pick this up through the milk letdown reflex. Their breasts start squeezing out milk. It's an oxytocin-mediated reflex uh, that normally happens when they hear their baby cry. When it happens to women who are miles away from the baby, and of course they can't hear it cry, they usually assume the baby needs them and they ring home on their mobile phone and they're nearly always right. So um, this is an area where it's possible to do empirical research. Um, and it's also possible to do empirical research on the, the most common kind of telepathy in the modern world, telephone telepathy, where people pick up when a person is thinking of them and about to ring them, their intention to call. About 85% of the population have had this experience uh, as surveys reveal. Um, and skeptics and materialists have dismissed this evidence of this very common phenomenon for more than a hundred years by simply saying, oh, it's just wishful thinking, it's superstition, it's just coincidence, without a shred of evidence, totally evidence-free uh, hypothesis making, armchair skepticism. If you do actual experiments, as I have done and others have done, uh, it turns out it's much more than just coincidence. My basic experiment involved four potential callers selected by the person who's the subject. Uh, they're people they know well. Um, 
the subject sits in a room with a landline phone, no caller idea being filmed. We pick one of the four callers at random, ring them up and ask them to call their friend. Um, they think about them for a minute or two and then call them. And then the uh, person, when the phone rings, has to guess which of these four people it is that's calling. They can't know by any normal means because it's a random, they're randomly chosen. And by chance, they'd be right 25% of the time, approximately. In these filmed experiments, they're right about 45% of the time. And um, this is enormously significant with hundreds of trials, uh, way above the chance level. Most people have no problem with telephone telepathy. If I discuss it with normal groups of people, uh, they say, oh yeah, of course, that happens to me all the time. Even if I discuss it with scientific colleagues in private, they say the same. But in public, they know they're not meant to believe in this, so they just keep quiet um, because they don't want to cause problems for themselves because it's such a deep taboo within uh, academic science and within scientific institutions to deny telepathy and the sense of being stared at because they go against the materialist idea the mind's just inside the brain. If the mind is more extensive than the brain, materialism must be wrong. And of course, that's not a thought they can entertain. Um, although um, what I've actually found is that the majority of, of, of scientists are not deeply committed materialists. They pretend to be while they're at work, but in the evenings, um, um, they're, they're normal people. Like many of them have dogs that know when they're coming home. Many of them know when people are going to phone. Uh, if they're women, some of them had the experience of picking up their baby's needs from a distant, uh, distance when they go back to the lab and start work. The milk let down reflex happens even there in the hallowed halls of the laboratory. Um, so um, the, the, in private life, most materialists are well aware uh, that these things really happen, but they, they have to deny them in public. Um, so telepathy happens as a result of close emotional bonding. And this also occurs, of course, between therapists and clients in what Freud called transference and countertransference. And both Freud and Jung had many telepathic experiences with their uh, uh, patients um, when they were away from them during the week between seeing them, um, they, they, they both of them had experiences that were very clearly telepathic. Freud told his followers like Ernest Jones never to mention this in public because it might underline the, undermine the scientific credibility of psychoanalysis. Um, but um, in private, uh, they discussed it and many Freudian analysis, analysts discussed this in private uh, with each other. Um, many of them now accept this. And Freud was a member of the British Society for Psychical Research. So even Freudians uh, are, are more open to this than some of them may appear on the surface. So uh, telepathy tells us that our minds are more extended in space than we usually assume. They're extended in time, as I've already said, through memory. They're extended in time to the future as well um, through precognitions, which often occur in dreams, precognitive dreams or presentiments, which are where people pick up that some emotional disturbance is about to happen in the near future. And again, I think these are things which animals have uh, better developed than we do. I think that's why there are so many stories of animals uh, seeming to know when earthquakes and tsunamis are happening, even several days in advance. I've studied most of the earthquakes and tsunamis in the last 25 years, and in almost every case, uh, there are animals, wild and domesticated, showing abnormal behavior beforehand. This could be used as a warning system for earthquakes, except seismologists simply dismiss it as superstition. But everyone's now got mobile phones all over the world, and it would be very easy to have a system where people phoned in or sent a message if they noticed an unusual animal behavior and have a whole grassroots earthquake forecasting system, which would cost a tiny fraction of what modern seismology costs and probably be much more effective. This is one of the things that could happen if uh, science is liberated from the strong materialist dogmas that still bind it. 
I discussed these, of course, in my recent book, The Science Delusion. Now, finally, I'd like to talk about the way in which minds are extended um, to other forms of consciousness. With, with dogs and other humans um, and cats and, and other animals, we're talking about a kind of horizontal linkage of minds between members of social groups. But all religious and spiritual traditions believe that there are minds uh, beyond the human level, um, angels, ancestors, spirits, saints, God, um, and that, that humans can contact these other forms of consciousness through prayer or through spontaneous mystical experiences or through near-death experiences, which often uh, mystically uh, involve a sense of mystical connection. Um, and that there are other realms of consciousness beyond the human level. And spirituality is about connecting with them. And religions are about um, whole systems of relating to these other dimensions of reality through rituals, through chants, through a whole range of spiritual practices which are the subject of my two most recent books, um, which you may or may not have seen. This is one is science and spiritual practices, dealing with seven different practices, including um, connecting with nature, gratitude, meditation, and pilgrimage, and singing and chanting. And the other one, ways to go beyond and why they work with another seven practices, including uh, prayer, petitionary prayer, um, fasting, spiritual openings through psychedelics, um, and uh, a whole variety of other spiritual practices. Where are they? Um, yes, holy days and festivals, uh, which enable us to uh, connect with um, other people in a community and sports, uh, which are not usually thought of as a spiritual practice in our secular society. But many spiritual practices are about coming into the present, because you can only experience other realms of consciousness in the present. Uh, meditation is about coming into the present. But sports do that more quickly and more effectively for most people, um, uh, more effectively than anything else. If you're 50 feet up a rock face, um, you're not worrying about whether you paid the gas bill or not. If you're on a football field and someone's passing you a ball and the crowd's cheering and you're near the goal, you're not going to worry about some remark somebody made yesterday that pissed you off. Um, ruminations, the default mode network, all these kinds of things just disappear. And many people have spiritual experiences in connection with sports. Um, and I don't think this is a coincidence. I think it's because sports are one of the most effective ways of bringing us into the present. Another practice I discuss is learning from animals, because many animals exist far more in the present than we do. And actually, I think animals probably have mystical and spiritual experiences more often than most people. I don't think these are just confined to the human realm. Um, so I think the mind's extended in space, in time, and also in a way that enables us to uh, link with other forms of consciousness. So that's a very brief overview of some of the areas I've been interested in over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and I hope that some of those relate to what you're studying and what you're practicing um, when you work as psychotherapists. Thank you, Dr. Sheldrake. Thank you. All right, Steve, are you okay? Yes, thank you, Dr. Sheldrake. That was fantastic. Um, you covered so much there that is indeed very, very applicable to what we do professionally. Um, remarkable, actually, <laughs> that there is so much there. I like the way, amongst many other things, how you think in, in a very joined up and connected way, uh, without artificial boundaries, without any kind of reductionism based on a dogma. Um, you go on real observations of real phenomena. Um, and will not shy away from that in pursuit of the truth. I, I think that's just, it's just marvellous uh, in and of itself. And I, I thank you for that. And I thank you for the inspiration you, you've given to Paul and I over the last 40 years as well, uh, which has been a gift in our life. And I, I thank you for that. 
Um, one of the things that really stands out for us is the importance of your ideas for the therapeutic relationship, which you did touch upon when you, when you mentioned transference. Um, we've heavily em emphasized relational dynamics between people. Um, absence of the theory or any kind of theory to interpret that um, when, when you talk about being in the presence and being immediate, that's another very important thing for us too, because you can pick up so much. There's one other thing too that, that I, I've observed, I know Pauline has too, over the years, is a very peculiar phenomenon that what Carl Jung described as being complexes. Uh, originally, they were psychophysiological and psychosocial systems that had a degree of autonomy um, separate to the normal ego consciousness uh, that, that people would suffer from in a sense that would be labeled as a neurotic split or a division. Very often, it's as if you are recognized by a subclass, if you like, of, of that kind of entity. So if I were to work with someone, say, 30, 35 years ago, and then I, I, I meet a, a person with a similar configuration of an issue, there comes a point in that relational contact to that other human being when you can feel it. it's a somatic resonance, a sympathetic resonance, as the old hypnotists would have, would have described it in the mid-19th century, where you know and, and the person you're working with knows it's a shared moment that's conscious and unconscious in psychodynamic terms, that that thing within them, now I call it that metaphorically, recognises you, you've met before. Although it's a completely different human being with a different autobiographical history, nevertheless, the configuration that life has put them in that has caused this division, and then this natural system within them, which is trying to deal with that problem, recognizes you. It's and then when you, when you communicate that back, there are many ways that this can happen. But when you communicate it back, it will acknowledge that it knows you. And that makes the working with that person so much easier. It takes a lot of the confrontation out. Uh, it, it is a transcend, transcendent state. It's not like normal consciousness at all. It, it's very strange. Um, and as we were saying uh, ahead of the uh, our meeting today earlier, that together with, with James, um, that this is this is something which is so significant in terms of being able, being able to understand human nature, uh, that it can't be taught, it has to be experienced. And when you have experienced it, in common with other factors, there's no doubt at all that, that uh, human beings are in a matrix of fields that interact with other human beings. Mm. Uh, that's of such immense significance. So I, I would like to thank you for, for providing us with a way of understanding that, which dovetails, albeit at right angles, to biology, but without which a fuller understanding of the work that we do wouldn't be possible. So thank you for that. Well, I'm very pleased to know about this, this complex, this experience of these complexes. Yeah. And um, of course that does fit very well with morphic resonance. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's something that happens all through biology that instinctive behavior in animals um, in a way taps into a collective memory of what their ancestors have experienced. Like baby chicks um, cower or freeze if you drag a cardboard model of a hawk overhead. Yes. The silhouette of a hawk causes that fear reaction. Um, and there's nothing in their personal experience that would enable them to recognize a hawk. And yet, in the past, many chicks and other birds have uh, experienced the silhouette of a hawk and have then come to a sorry end soon afterwards. So there's a, a, a kind of resonance with that situation and the, the, the feeling of danger that goes with it. So I think that this, this complex thing you're talking about is, is very interesting. And actually you could probably do experiments with it. You could, like, I don't know if you do in your training pro process. Well, we, 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 we go back, um... We start with hypnosis, we start with trans states when it comes to skills, because that is the absolute foundation, we believe anyway, for psychotherapy. And therefore, the, the two parents, the legitimate parents of psychotherapy are medicine and hypnosis. Academic psychology has got almost nothing to do with it. And 
they got involved further downstream for historical purposes. But the idea of uh, rapport being a sympathetic resonance was so important to the, the early figures in this, this discipline. Uh, and how that then mutated, if you like, into the notion of transference uh, and then even into a Jungian uh, uh, analogue of alchemy. You know, we'll use this as a, as a metaphor for um, the dissolution of your own personal identity that occurs when you work in depth. And then that deep structure resonance that comes through. And when, when you feel that with someone, there's absolutely no doubt. Uh, I am a critic of Jung in the sense that he's he's uh, he's. He's misused, I think, in popular psychology at the moment. But there is a kernel of extreme practicality in his work. And one of the two pillars of that is his work with complexes um, before the split with Sigmund Freud. And the other is his work on the, the true depth of human relationship, which he allegorized as alchemical. They are real. You, you really feel it. And uh, when Paul and I... Pauline was, was working in psychiatry and I've worked in cardiac rehabilitation at Charing Cross Hospital in London with a very enlightened uh, team of uh, medics there. When we both moved into primary health care, something happened then which uh, shocked me, but at the same time I realised we, we had to go with it. That Personally, I, I went in with a very Jungian mindset uh, and yet what we were meeting were people who manifested more Freudian issues. I, I don't mean the usual superficial uh, Freudian issues, but more to do with what Joseph or Joseph Breuer and Sigmund Freud had experienced in Vienna in 1895. They were there and the Jungian approach at that point in time, it, it, it wouldn't take. We had to treat those people with the same dignity, respect and insight, uh, using rapport for what they were signaling through their symptomology. Uh, and we were seeing what Breuer and Freud were saying. And so long as we were in harmonic resonance with that, we began to turn people around really, really quickly. And we were getting a reputation for being able to do that. And it got so bad that we were having people sent from different practices, psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, with their most troublesome psychosomatic, Freud would have called them hysterical uh, patients. And the thing that brought it about was that quality of relationship and resonance. But for us, it was as if Freud and Breuer were somehow present. And that went so far. And then later, Jung re, uh, returned, building upon that foundation. And of course, Breuer and Freud were built upon the, the foundation of very early hypnotherapists, people like uh, Charcot, who was Freud's teacher, and Pierre Jeanne, who was Jung's teacher. And that's uh, that blending of a, of a medical approach, which was not psycho, sorry, was not bioreductive, but seen within that broader framework, it worked really well. So, again, it, it, I, I totally accept what your message is for, for people like us, for professionals like us. And it's, uh, it's so important for the future. At our time of life, we know that, you know, we're going to have to hand the baton over. And these guys are part of the next generation. And we really feel that it's important that, that they are as well equipped as possible to make new discoveries and to move forward. Mm. Again, for us, this is part of that, that field, that field phenomenon. The, the, the impression that you made upon me that I couldn't understand it fully, I probably can't now, but 40 years ago, I certainly couldn't understand it fully. But I felt intuitively that this was somehow going to be the bridge between the Jungian influence I had and everything else. I was very influenced by, uh, I know you, you know Professor Stephen Rose, um, I was influenced by him in terms of systems um, and uh, the exchange of energy and information between nested hierarchies of systems mm -hmm. so we could find a way to to link mind and body in a meaningful way that wasn't reduced to one uh, one system and then in London I was exposed to George Angle, the biopsychosocial uh, model theory uh, all of that came together. In the background, there were your ideas, but I, I, I didn't know if I could ever reach out. Or, uh, now, obviously, I can, uh, and that, that's a marvellous thing. So mm -hmm. even in this today, I think there's some sympathetic harmonic resonance, morphic resonance for these guys here for the future, that they can move well, on what Paul and I have done. Well, there may be, um, I'm afraid, I mean, it's very interesting you say that. Um, I myself uh, haven't done much with hypnosis, but I was 
I'm interested by the fact that some of the very first telepathic experiments that were done in the 1830s were done with hypnosis. And I don't know if you're familiar with Esdale's work. Yes, yes, I am. Yes. 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 Well, uh, uh, probably everyone is then. You may have talked about it. But in Esdale's uh, work where he hypnotized people, he was working in India in Bengal. Yes. Um, yeah. Hypnotized people for anesthesia in surgery. Um, and then those experiments on community of sensation, as he called it, where he'd be in one place, a patient he'd hypnotized would be somewhere else. And then he would put a servant would hand him a, a, something like a banana or a lime or um, some food that he'd put in his mouth. And the other person would then say what they tasted. And there was a kind of telepathic transmission of taste. Um, um, which he called community of sensation. And it would be a, a wonderful way of actually studying um, the, the hypnosis and its effects on this kind of bonding and transfer of information in a very simplified system. I mean, I know you're primarily concerned with therapy and stuff. I'm afraid my mind goes to simplified experiments that could shed, you know, where you could investigate the phenomenon yes, in, in this simplified right. scientific way. As we, we mentioned earlier, Paul and I worked with a, a spiritual healer for five years, and I actually went to him uh, with the intention of, of a very young young man to expose him as a hypnotist, and the, he was using hypnosis. Uh, well, he wasn't, or he didn't seem to be, and, and he would um, he would he could manifest uh, energy projection, which I I can look at differently for a different lens as being mesmeric magnetic energy. Um, as a qigong or qigong from china or any of these other cultural manifestations i've experienced most of them uh, and, and with the chinese in depth and i can say that they're identical they feel identical the difference is the culture which hides the similarities the effects are there uh, and what i've learned through the hypnotic uh, work that the point i've done and working with john kane the late john kane who was a healer was that you, you can manifest this very, very quickly, almost instantly, which the Chinese don't like to think about. You know, they're, they're very Confucian. They, they have this hierarchical approach to learning anything. Um, but we were uh, gifted by John, uh, John Kane. He, he said, literally, you can now do this. You, you can help me. Uh, and we were able to do it. And it was instant and it could be felt by other people. And all sorts of parapsychological phenomena occurred around him. People would come and test him, put him on the mind mirror. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with that machine. Um, yes. But, yeah, yeah, put him on that. Uh, Buddhist monks would come from Japan. Um, all sorts of people. He was incredible. Mm. He was an uh, absent healer too, wasn't he? Exactly, that's yeah. where I was going to go. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> it's all right, I was wondering. Um, absence healing, which yeah. was the, uh, the projection of, of a healing effect at a distance. Mm. He was competent at that, uh, and I had I had several uh, experiences uh, with him. Uh, I used to be a police officer as well. I, I was doing a lot of the psychotherapy work part time at a local mm -hmm. hospital, uh, and I was driving to an emergency call one evening. Um, his house was on the hill. I, I had to go that route. I was driving down. Everything was going. The lights and siren, and I felt this urge to stop. And I did. I stopped the police car. I, I went in um, and there was this, this wizened old lady on the door uh, called Ethel, who was the psychic doorkeeper, if you like. She, she handled everybody coming in to see John. I said, where is John? She said, in the sanctuary. So I went downstairs into this, this area, which was a sanctuary, in a trance state, in effect. Um, opened the door. He looked up at me and smiled and raised his hand and said, oh, OK, back to the emergency. That night, I saw the man he was working on um, as a, an image, as, a, as, a, as, a, as like a swirling tunnel within which he was having a heart attack and his wife was panicking. And instead of ringing the ambulance, she rang John. I noted the time. Uh, I went back there the next day. I, I, I recounted what happened and it was confirmed that he did indeed have a heart attack at that very time. And uh, his wife rang John Kane rather than the ambulance. And there's many, many other things that, that happened around that and since that. So I'm very open about things that can be experienced phenomenologically, that have some verification, uh, that make sense, that are embedded in what Jung called the Unus Mundus, the one world. Um, I'm fine with that. Uh, I'm skeptical about a lot of things, but not about things that can be experienced. Mm. 
sorry if I, t I went on too long there. <laughs> There's some questions that were submitted in advance. So is, from what you've been saying today, Dr. Sheldrake, I've taken some of them out because they've been, they've been answered by what you said. But there are a few which I think are pretty cool. Uh, one of them is, is basically right off the back of what Steve was saying. So this, this works quite nicely. It comes from Marco, who uh, I can see your name down the side, mate, but I can't see you at the moment. Um, what is your experience and or understanding of mesmerism as a form of healing? So the, the John Cain projected energy stuff that Steve was talking about. Well, actually, very little, I'm afraid, because um, I've not, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist rather than a healer. And um, I've not worked with many people who, who do hypnosis. I have tried doing some of those Esdale experiments with Community of Sensation, which I did with uh, a popular hypnotist, Paul McKenna. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, but the um, you know he he's a busy person and we just didn't have long enough to do some proper experiments and I just didn't know any other hypnotists at the time, um, so I'm afraid I I just have almost no experience. So I mean I can talk about lots of subjects, but I'm afraid that's one of them where I have very little to say. Sorry. Oh, no worries at all. Thank you. Uh, there was one that uh, it's a very similar question that came from Foster, who's here, and Jared, who is also here with the camera off. Um, so to shorten it right down, basically the crux of the question is basically saying uh, a lot of your work around the mind extending beyond the body, a lot of it is about the conscious mind, as you say, attention and other such things. I wonder if you could talk a little bit around the unconscious mind, perhaps extending beyond the body. Gosh, this is such an interesting group of people, you know. I mean, this is these are the I don't get this kind of question from anyone else. Um, um, and I don't have ready answers either. Um, I just don't know. I mean, the unconscious mind, I'm sure, extends beyond the body through our emotions, our fears, uh, and so forth. And, you know, people pick up from other people you know, sort of vibes uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, and these are often about things that are unconscious in, in, uh, in the people they're picking them up from. Um, whether or not this could result in, or how it would result in things like poltergeist phenomena, um, apparitions, um, I just don't know. I've, um, I'm a member of the Society for Psychical Research and I've spent some time looking into poltergeists and indeed looked into one or two cases myself. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid I didn't end up any the wiser, really. I mean, there the, the were dramatic events happening, manifestations of writing on walls, um, objects falling, heavy objects moving, um, which I supposed were to do with, in this particular case in North London, it was a, a disturbed teenage girl, which is fairly classic. Um, uh, I suppose she wasn't, I'm sure, consciously doing these things. Um, and so I think these were unconscious manifestations of disturbances in her mind. Um, but again, there's not something you can do very easily do research on. Um, I think that another form of unconscious manifestation is, is the way in which um, there's a kind of telepathic link um, associated with accidents and death. Um, in my book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, I have a whole chapter on distant deaths and accidents. Um, I have a big database. I collect stories from people about their animals and about themselves. I have about 12,000 case histories on my database. Um, and that's where I start from in my research. I start from natural history, what people experience, what people find, what people say they've experienced. Um, so that's why I got into dogs that know when their owners are coming home, telephone telepathy, telepathy between mothers and babies, and so forth. I didn't conjure these ideas out of thin air. I had dozens of stories about these from people, hundreds of stories in the case of dogs that know over a thousand stories uh, about dogs that know when their owners are coming home, um, which show 
consistent patterns. And one of these consistent patterns is that dogs and sometimes cats can pick up when they're in as dying or is in a dire and dangerous situation. For example, in one story, there was a woman from St. Albans told me that she went away with her husband for the Easter holidays. They left their dog with a neighbor. Um, at midnight on Easter Saturday, he had a heart attack and soon afterwards died. And she rang the neighbor the next day and the neighbor said, well, thank goodness you've rung. She said, just after midnight, the dog started howling and we couldn't find anything wrong with it. And, you know, we thought of calling a vet, but there was no, it didn't seem to be anything wrong. We didn't understand what was going on. And it was at the same time that he died. Now, I think that would be an unconscious manifestation. I don't think he would have been primarily thinking about the dog when he was dying. I think the dog was picking up uh, what was happening to him. And similar things happen when people have severe accidents. Uh, dogs and cats can pick this up. And so can other people. One of the things that started off the Society for Psychical Research and its work on telepathy uh, was in the 1880s, was the collection of stories about what they called phantasms of the dying, um, that lots of people reported uh, stories of suddenly seeing someone or hearing their voice or suddenly thinking about them or suddenly knowing there was something wrong with them. Um, at the moment, it later turned out when people died, quite often these were people who were abroad in India or places like that, and they had to wait weeks for letters to arrive telling them of people's death. Um, but the, so they were over enormous distances. And at the beginning of the Society for Psychical Research, they had a debate. They said, is this the person who's dying coming to say goodbye? Is this only about people who are dying? Or can it be also from people who are not dying? And they then conducted a survey they called Phantasms of the Living, um, where they collected stories of apparitions and appearances. Um, and they found this happened with people who were alive as well, especially if they were in great need. They'd had an accident, for example. Um, and then they said, well, it's not just about dying that this happens. It's something about needs. And then that got them into telepathy. And one of the uh, founders, Frederick Myers, one of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research, coined the term telepathy, um, which means literally tele, distant, pathy, feeling. It's about distant feeling. People often assume it's about thought transference primarily, um, but it's not. It's about distant feeling. And again, this is picking up unconscious um, feelings uh, from other people. Uh, there is not a, somebody de deliberately channeling an intention to that person. It is the case with telephone telepathy, you're channeling an intention to that person in the sense you're going to call them, you want to speak to them. But for someone who's had an accident or who's dying, uh, it's more diffuse and it's more like uh, an unconscious influence of that person, which affects those who are bonded uh, to them. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that helps Foster and Jared. So uh, you've actually answered another question there as well, by the way, so I can knock that one off of the list. But there's there's one that comes from Sharon, if Sharon is here. Yes, she is. Um, Which one, goes, James? Uh, the first one that you sent through, Sharon, if that was okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Shell Drake, have you had a chance to really look at the biopsychosocial, what we call the stack? which is this linear diagram that starts with number one and ends with 20. And it shows the biological, psychological, and then social. It's like a diagram. Are you familiar with it? I'm afraid I'm not, Sharon. I, I oh. saw your question just before we began, and um, I didn't have time to look it up. But, you know, this is a really advanced seminar that I'm here in. I mean, this, <laughs> I, I don't get these kinds of questions normally. Um, and um, I'm not familiar with this. So, again, I'm sorry I won't be able to comment on it because um, 
uh, I were, it's quite complicated. I wouldn't be able to get up to speed. If you can summarize a question without my knowing about the stack, um, I might try and answer it, but I'm not familiar with this system. Um, well, I will try and then you can pass if you think it's too, mm -hmm. too um, I don't know, complex. Um, well, in that diagram, we sort of map out um, starting at the bottom, the biology, human biology, starting really from, and, and James, I can't even read it because, um, but it starts at a molecular atomic level, and then it works its way up through the different systems of the body to a middle level, which is more of psychological, psychological and that's where we as therapists kind of meet um, the client in a dyadic sort of relationship. But we also look at not only the patient's biology and how things are presenting biologically, but psychologically, and then the social component of their lives. And that social component really extends out past the family and into the community and into the nation and into the world. And pretty much at the top of the chart, it has the uh, earth or the, you know, the earth as an ecosphere. And I'm wondering if you might place morphic residence. I'm, I'm really having the sense that it's time to blow the top out of, off of the stack a little bit, and maybe even the bottom off <laughs> out of it, because it feels like what you're talking about is kind of like extends above our biopsychosocial stack, but also below it. And I almost want to bend it into a circle, you know, um, so that this this idea of the morphic field, the morphic resonance. And I think that's what we tap into when we call our, our, our rapport field with the client. But I'm not seeing it exactly on our biopsychosocial stack. And I feel like maybe that's what you're here for in a way this is all my intuition i could be you know whatever but so do you have any kind of comment about that um do you see a place beyond the ecosphere where we might be in our work tapping into morphic resonance the morphic field and how that um relates to biologically psychologically socially hmm. out of the top and then back around from a genomic perspective, how it might yeah. actually turn this into a circle. Okay, well, um, first of all, I would say that morphic resonance applies at every level, even atoms and molecules have a kind of collective memory in morphic resonance. So every kind of form, order, pattern, structure in nature um, is, is sustained by morphic resonance. Um, in fact, I think even the way that an atom continues to exist depends on morphic resonance. Its it continued existence is because it resonates with itself. Um, there's no such thing, according to modern physics, as just stuff that just stays there inertly. All mm. atomic level things are all processes. They're all vibratory processes. And a vibration works through time. Waves take time to wave in. And um, so I think it, even individual atoms and molecules are resonating with themselves, like we are resonating with ourselves, maintaining our form and our memory. Um, so I would say morphic resonance applies all through at every level. Um, now it applies to the Gaia, Gaia. I think the entire planet, the biosphere is resonating with itself in the past and has a kind of memory. Um, and it may be that things that have happened several times like ice ages um, have a kind of morphic field and when a new ice age begins uh, the whole sort of planet may think oh here we go again um, and, <laughs> and it's, it's sort of the be sort of thing, things that would tend to happen in repetitive patterns um, but the planet of course is part of a larger system the solar system um, which also i think has a morphic field i think the entire solar system is a kind of organism and the whole tradition of astrology is really about um, how our earth here and, and our life here is part of a larger organism the solar system and the relations between the parts change as the planets move 
I'm not particularly well informed in, in astrology, but the basic idea of the whole solar system as an organism makes sense to me. And the solar system is part of a larger organism still, the galaxy. Um, and the galaxy is part of the entire universe, uh, which is also a complex system, uh, which I think has um, a, a psychological or mental or um, conscious aspect. I also think that the, within our solar system, the sun is probably conscious. Um, and as you may know, the, there's been a shift in, in within academic philosophy of mind in the last 10 years or so, uh, a rise of panpsychism, the idea that there could be forms of consciousness at many levels in nature, even atoms or electrons at a very low, low level of mind. Um, and that, that um, so within that, the idea of the sun being conscious is, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, an idea which could be, um, is, I think we need to consider. In fact, I wrote a paper on this, which was published earlier this year in the Journal of Consciousness Studies called Is the Sun Conscious? Um, as a contribution to the current debate about panpsychism, trying to move things on uh, beyond where they usually it ends with humans or possibly the earth. But I think if we carry it further and we take the idea that the, the whole solar system may have a mind or consciousness, the entire galaxy and the entire universe, um, we then have many levels of consciousness beyond our own. It may be that we can't relate to them because they're so different. But if we look at traditional cultures, people do relate to them. Um, I lived in India for seven years. And um, what the, the most famous prayer in the Hindu tradition is the Gayatri mantra. It's a bit like the Lord's Prayer in Christianity. It's the most well-known of, of the prayers. And that's a prayer to the glorious splendor of the sun to illuminate our meditation. And there's a yoga exercise, Surya Namaskar, which I do every morning, I have done for more than 40 years, um, which is prostration to the sun, greeting the sun in the morning. And in, in India, among Hindus, and in many other parts of the world, uh, people relate to the heavenly bodies um, as conscious beings. We still call the planets by the names of the Greek and Roman gods, you know, Venus, Mars, Mercury, etc. And Plato called the planets and the sun the visible gods. He thought they had minds or consciousness uh, which related to us here on earth. And then uh, I think that the, my own personal view is that there's a consciousness underlying all nature and pervading all nature, uh, which is what we sometimes contact through the deepest kinds of mystical experiences on which all religions are based. They're all based on primarily on this direct experience of a greater consciousness than our own. The Buddha didn't become enlightened by doing a PhD. Um, Jesus didn't recognize his deep connection with, with God as a father um, by studying in a rabbinical seminary. These were direct experiences uh, that they had. And such direct experiences, I think, lie at the heart of all religions, including shamanic practices. They're not about textbook learning or just passing exams, they're about direct experience. And actually, I suspect from what I've heard um, of, of your group here, that, that part of what you're doing taps into that kind of shamanic dimension of the human psyche, and indeed of the wider realm of nature. I mean, shamanism is about the direct experience of these more than personal forces and, and patterns and, and activities. Um, and uh, so I suspect that this kind of shamanic archetype is, is, is one of the things that uh, is at work in what you do, but you know better than me about what you're doing. Anyway, in relation to the continuum idea, I would say that there's, there's, there's many ways in which uh, morphic resonance, morphic fields um, uh, uh, operate at many different levels of nature. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, how are you doing for time, Dr. Sheldrake? 
Well, um, I told my wife we'd be finishing around 7.30, so we've got, by my watch, another eight minutes or so. Let's make the most out of those eight minutes. Okay, uh, let's see, shall we? Okay, there's a question here from Lorcan. It's quite, it's quite a nuanced one, I think. What is the most efficient way to interact with what is unproven? When you intuited your theories before the scientific process, how did you engage with such things such as morphic fields? They were clearly active before being discovered, yet without a scientific approach, there's a real risk of losing oneself in unhelpful projection onto the unknown. For example, the concerns that we often bring up at IPSA regarding such woo-woo things, in other words, things that are not directly experienced. So I'm wondering what you might think about that. Well, in my own, since part of this is autobiographical, in my own case, I, 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 I thought about morphogenetic fields, um, form shaping fields, because I was doing research on plant growth. This was at Cambridge. I was a Don at Cambridge working on plant development. And I worked out how the main plant hormone, auxin, is produced um, and worked out how it's transported in plants. And this was completely at the leading edge of what was happening in the field. And I knew all the leading edge researchers and, and so on. And, um, uh, you know, we were making rapid progress. But I realized that actually we explained too much. The, the aux in this hormone occurs in all plants and in all parts of every plant. And the way it's transported is a system that's present in all plants. And so basically what we'd done was discovered something about, as it were, the plumbing system of plants. It's like having a complete understanding or a very good understanding of plumbing, pipes, taps, water tanks, water pressure, etc. cetera. Um, um, and if you look in buildings of every kind, every kind of house and hotel and, and, and tower block, they've all got plumbing systems and the plumbing systems work in much the same way, but they've got completely different building plans, architectures, and the, build, the plumbing doesn't explain the architecture. It's always related to the architecture. The taps go to bathrooms wherever they are and so on, um, but it's not the taps that cause the bathroom, the pipes that cause the bathrooms um, or cause the plan. And I realized something like that's happening in plants. There must be a kind of invisible plan that shapes the plants. Then I realized that actually this concept existed already, the morphogenetic field. Then I realized that these fields couldn't be inherited through genes, which just depend on, um, they just code for proteins and they don't explain shape or form. They explain, it's like the bricks and the cement and the structures in a building, uh, but they don't explain the overall form or plan. Um, so how could they be inherited? Clearly they're inherited. Roses give rise to roses, giraffes give rise to giraffes. They've got giraffe genes and rose genes, but they don't in themselves explain the form. Something else is going on. The fields are inherited in a different way. Um, at that stage, I read a book by the French philosopher Henri Bergson, a, a, a book called Matter and Memory, written in 1896, where Bergson argued that memories were not stored in the brain. He was a very radical philosopher. And he liberated me from the idea that memories have to be physical things. Um, and when I applied that idea to morphogenetic fields and realized there could be a kind of resonance across time, uh, it was one of those aha moments. I mean, everything changed. Suddenly the world looked different. And I realized there are a huge number of implications. Um, it was tremendously exciting. I spent several day weeks probably in a, in a somewhat manic state as uh, things came into focus in a whole new way um, through this insight. But the insight itself came in a flash. Most people have had insights. Most of us have had new ideas of one kind or another. And they come in a flash. It's notoriously difficult to explain creativity. Um, so in my own case, uh, the, 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 this came in a flash. And, but then I took another seven or eight years working out the idea before I wrote a book about it, A New Science of Life, the one that Steve referred to. 
uh, which was published in 1981. This flash happened in 1973. And um, then um, I've spent years of trying to do experiments. The new edition of A New Science of Life summarizes 25 years of experiments. Then it's a matter of testing the idea experimentally. Um, and I strongly believe in the importance of the scientific method. I try and do experiments on the phenomena I'm interested in, like the sense of being stared at, telephone telepathy, dogs that know when their owners are coming home, mothers reacting telepathically to babies, and morphic resonance underlying the inheritance of behavior and biological form. So I think that the, uh, the check, really, the ultimate check of all these things is you can have an inspiration, you can have a new insight, but then you have to work it out in a way that fits with other things and makes sense. And I, I found that discussing it with other people was always very helpful here. Um, and then work out how it can actually be tested. Um, and, uh, and then do the actual experiments. <coughs> so I think this acts as a check on unbridled speculation. I mean, I've had plenty of ideas which turn out not to be true. Um, they're not all, not all intuitions or insights are necessarily true. Um, they have to go through this filter of discussion to see if they make sense to other people and in the light of other facts that are already known and whether or not, uh, and then whether they can actually be tested empirically. But from what I gather about from Steve and what I've heard this evening, it sounds as if that's what you are actually doing, that you're not only learning about minds, but you're actually experiencing through working with people um, some of these phenomena and directly experiencing them. That's why I just had this flash that there's a kind of shamanic element in it all. Um, and, and, and so I probably, you know what I'm talking about in terms of experience and, 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 um, and not, it not just being wild speculation. Um, the other thing that I do um, is, as I mentioned already, is collect stories about people's experience. Um, because if you collect stories, if it's just one story, it's an anecdote. Um, and it may not relate to anything else. But if you get hundreds of anecdotes about the same thing, um, then anecdotes turn into data. And um, for example, I had somebody told me that their cat always knew when they were going to take it to the vet uh, and hid, and they couldn't find the cat when they wanted to go to the vet. Then I asked, uh, then I had other stories about this. Then I put out an appeal for information. And I got dozens of stories about people saying their cat did this. Then with my assistance, we rang up all the vets in the North London Yellow Pages and asked them if they ever had a problem with people missing appointments with cats. And all but one of them said, yes, it happens all the time. People say they just can't find the cat. The one exception said it happened so often that they'd given up the appointment system for cats. Uh, so uh, you see, here's an example of where a story can become a natural history. And then by inquiry, like, doing uh, by ringing up vets and stuff, we find this is not just some kind of totally off the wall observation, some, some fantastical observation that one person might simply have imagined, but we've got here a consistent pattern of behavior, which could actually be experimentally investigated. People could try uh, making appointments for vets at randomly chosen times, you could have cameras studying the behavior of the cat, and so on. I mean, this could, I haven't actually done that with cats and vets, but uh, there's a limit how many experiments I can actually do. Um, but, you know, if I had graduate students doing PhDs, that would be a good PhD topic to look into this. So, anyway, I think the empirical uh, data, the relating it to experience is really the key together with imagination and insight. I think we need both. I mean, if we just had experience and, and dismissed imagination would be very plodding and, and rather boring. And if we have only imagination and so on, we get kind of wild speculation. I get emails several a week from people who are obviously somewhat unbalanced with wild speculations about the nature of the universe and reality. Some may be brilliant insights, but 
if they're just sort of individual speculations without relating to the broader context of ideas and experience, then they're not much use to anyone else. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, it looks like we're a few minutes over time. So Steve, was there anything else you just wanted to quickly jump in and say? Well, uh, other than, thank you, Dr. Shel Sheldrake. Um, other than thanking you again and again <laughs> for everything <laughs> that you, you've, you've brought uh, to us today. Uh, it, it, again, I, I'll keep repeating myself. It's been a wonderful privilege. Thank you on behalf of all of us. And uh, if it's convenient for you at some time in the future, it'd be wonderful to, to do this again. Oh, yes. uh, we have a, a continuing throughput of yes. our students, and I'm sure the guys here have all been massively stimulated by hearing you. And thank you so much. Thanks. Good. Well, thank you. And all the best to you all. And may your studies go well and your healing go well. Best things. Thank you. Thank so, you. Take care.